Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this ARS webinar. Professor Ann Chang is going to present us her research and the results of these guidelines, ARS guidelines, on bronchiectasis. Professor Ann Chang is a, an established leading researcher in this field, and her work has been published in several international and national uh, journals. She has been having many guidelines, the IRS, and many panels in the chest. Uh, Professor Ran Chang is also very famous for her particular work with indigenous children in Australia. She comes from Brisbane and from Darwin. I'm sure that this webinar will be very interesting for all of you. I would like you to participate actively, sending your questions in the questions and answer part. And please, when you write your question, put it for participants and panel two, so participants can see your questions also. Please, Anne. Thank you very much, Ami. Um, so thank you, Ali, from the ERS for organizing this webinar. Um, I will start with... Um, the slide's not moving forward. So um, this is not just me. So um, Professor Kanta is um, uh, the co-chair. And uh, on the top here, you can see Jeanette, Zina, and Leanne, who are members of the ERS and parents, who's ELF and parents who substantially helped us. Tommy, Tonya is um, uh, from the uh, ERS methodologists, and we are a multidisciplinary group. So you've got Keith, who's an ID physician, Rebecca, who is a um, general practitioner and co-editor of uh, the Cochrane, Chris Wilson's a physio, uh, Wu Jung is a immunologist, Gabriel a, a nurse, and um, Effie is a radiologist. And we also have uh, a whole lot of respiratory people, Andy, Bulent, Angela, Fabio, and Deborah. And lastly, but not the least, we've got two adult uh, physicians, uh, Adam Hill and James, who are well known in the bronchiectasis world. So I've got conflicts in the fact that I've got the grants, uh, but they are all um, peer reviewed, the national grants uh, in Australia. So over the next few minutes, um, um, the aim is to highlight the ERS clinical practice guideline for pediatric bronchiectasis. I will briefly outline the methodology followed by case presentations with guidelines embedded within it and MCQs. So let us start with the methodology. So this guideline is the first to use a combined methodology that the ERS pulled out three years ago now. You've got PICO questions on the left-hand heart side and you've got narrative questions. And they differ in some way, uh, which I'll come to in a little while. So our guideline consisted of seven PICOs and seven narrative questions. Um, how we went about developing the questions was that uh, we proposed some questions uh, as well as the outcomes for evaluating the interventions. These were then discussed at the panel meeting. Um, these were refined. Uh, and the outcomes were presented to the parent advisory group, and that was led by Jeanette Bolt from the European Lung Foundation. Um, and the questions were then modified by the panel based on the advice that we received. And the outcomes were then put up for voting um, by the panel and uh, the parent group as well. Uh, and the ended up with a final set of questions and outcomes used for the guideline. So concurrently, while the guideline was being developed, uh, Jeanette Bob with uh, Zina and Leanne uh, helped uh, with developing the parent survey, which was really important to put this guideline into perspective of parents as well as young adults uh, with uh, bronchiectasis. So when you interpret the guidelines, there are two things you need to know, uh, mainly the, the concept of the evidence level, which I'll come to a little while, and the strength of recommendations. So basically, there are two uh, levels of recommendations, strong and weak. And on, in the middle column, you can see the strong recommendations, which really means that everybody should do it. And weak or conditional recommendations mean that uh, 
it is limited and some people may or may not choose to do it. So let us now move on to the actual guidelines um, and please participate in the MCQs. So why a clinical practice guideline? Um, these are a couple of CT scans from a study that we did with the New Zealand group and they are um, young children as you can see, nine, years, nine months of age and 10 months of age with severe bronchiectasis. We know that in clinical practice we can make a difference in these children. So the goals of the guideline was to present um, evidence-based recommendations for managing children and adolescents with bronchiectasis unrelated to CF. And we are targeting anybody and everybody who's involved in the care of uh, these uh, children and adolescents. And we also want to use this to inform adolescents and parents so they can go to their doctor if they find that they're not receiving the correct recommendation and discuss it. It doesn't mean that it's appropriate for the child, but they, at least they can use it to discuss it with their treating doctor. So this is a patient that uh, at the time when Ali asked me to do this um, um, presentation was the next child on the list um, whom I saw who with, with bronchiectasis. So it's a young girl who's aged two years and three months, premature, um, as you can see there, uh, seeds supplemental oxygen 20 months earlier. She was referred for chronic cough since being hospitalized with what was called a viral pneumonitis but she always responds to four weeks of antibiotics. It's been on and off antibiotics for nine months. When the antibiotics stops, the cough returns after one to two weeks. The child is also wheezy and tends to splutter with uh, thin feet, sorry, thin fluids and gags on puris and solids. She has a mild uh, diplegic cerebral palsy, uh, growing very well there, as you can see. An examination was really unremarkable, other than the presence of a spontaneous wet cough. So she had no digital clubbing, or chest deformity. So this is the chest x-ray uh, when I saw the child and you can see that it's grossly abnormal um, but uh, remember this child is an ex-premature infant. So we come to our first question. You suspect this child has bronchiectasis. Um, regarding the radiographic diagnosis of bronchiectasis in children, which of the following is false? A. The diagnosis requires radiographic evidence in addition to the to presence of the clinical syndrome. B, a CT scan is required to diagnose bronchiectasis as X-ray findings are insensitive. C, a multi-detector CT scan with um, high resolution CT scan reconstruct as the gold standard. And D, the adult criteria, oops, the adult criteria, um, whoops, the answer has been given. I'm not sure why, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. The adult criteria should be used. Um, so, Ali, you take over and can you vote? I'm sorry, I already gave you the answer, but anyway. Oh, hosts and panels cannot vote. Okay. I thought um, I thought there was a voting thing, so. Um, there is a vote, there is a vote, yeah. It's already ready for it. Please, can sorry. you try to vote? It says host and panel cannot vote, so I'm not sure. Ali, are the results coming out? People are voting, Anne. Oh, so okay, sorry. We will allow for a few seconds and we stop, and then I will display the results. Sure, okay, thank Please you. Please bear with me for a few seconds. Okay. Nevertheless, although the answers were already given by Anne, I can see that only 67 Yeah, so the, 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 uh, I'll close this. So um, the answer is, um, I can't seem to advance the slides now, Ali. Uh, so the answer is D, um, and uh, this is the recommendation. Um, in children suspected of bronchiectasis, 
the, the question in the PICO is should multi detector CT scan uh, with HRCT reconstruct be used instead of conventional HRCT alone? And what criteria should be used for children? And the recommendation is here. We suggest that um, MDCT be used instead of just conventional HRCT, uh, and that we should use the pediatric um, uh, ratio instead of the adult ratio. So if we go to the grade, uh, this is what the grade evidence table shows. Um, so for every PICO, you can see that um, we come to this great thing. I don't expect you to read, but I just wanted to show you that this is how the evidence was derived. So there were two observational studies and the quality is low, um, but it's a critical outcome because that was selected by the panel as a very important outcome. Accompanied by this, uh, I don't expect you to read as well, but it's in the published guidelines. Uh, we went through every single study and summarized it as well. So the reason why we use, I'm um, um, sorry, so this, this is the child CT scan, and you can see there on the top right quadrant that there's a slightly dilated uh, airway next to, the adjacent, uh, next to the adjacent blood vessel. But um, um, if you look at that, that's been highlighted, and if you take a coronal view, you can see it a little bit clearly there. So without a um, um, MDCT, you wouldn't be able to see that. But more importantly, if you go to the HRCT of this particular child, on the right top pen panel, that was the closest HRCT slide. Um, this thing is very, doesn't move very well. Um, on the top right hand corner is the closest HRCT slide, the slides above and the slides below. And you can see there that if you just do a HRCT alone, you actually miss this child's uh, bronchiectasis. So remember, this child has got the clinical syndrome of bronchiectasis, and without an MDCT, you wouldn't have missed this child's um, bronchiectasis. And the reason why we um, take um, a lower cutoff in adults is in, represented in this particular slide. So this, this uh, slide is uh, bronchial arterial ratio on the y-axis and H on the left axis. Sorry, on the x-axis, and you can see that as you grow older, in people without any cardiopulmonary disease, it actually is a, you have a lower normal um, um, bronchial arterial ratio. Okay, and then if you actually extrapolate this line and draw another line there, you can see that the the um, upper limit is actually 0.7. Um, and if you look at studies, there are actually two studies in children. Um, this older study really did not quite um, look at this particular thing, but uh, you can find the data within that study. And the two studies have shown that the mean plus two standard deviation in children is uh, just under 0 0.8. And that's why we use 0 0.8 in children. And this brings us to the second question. So you suspect this child has bronchiectasis. So in addition to a CT scan, what other tests would you take um, in, in everyone? That is a minimal panel of uh, tests. Um, so Ali, do you want to just put yours up or shall I read it out so we save some time? Okay, that's good. Uh, so A is the standard uh, tests are required as it may influence treatment. B is all children should have uh, minimal tests as you can see there. C is investigation for paramyxillary dyskinesia is required in all. Uh, and D is uh, lower airway uh, bacterial disease should be obtained when possible. So if you could submit your um, answers now. Need some music in the background, but there's no music. So um, the majority have has it right. Um, so which the question is which is false? The majority has it right. So let us come to the um, the recommendation. 
Um, so the answer is um, uh, C, which is the false uh, statement. Okay. So uh, in the um, guideline, we, we asked the question, what standard tests that impact on clinical outcomes should be undertaken when managing this group of patients with suspected bronchiectasis? Um, and the answer is that uh, we suggest a minimum test, as you can see there. And we only suggest additional tests depending on their clinical representation. So we don't actually suggest a PCB testing to be done in every single child because you'd be wasting quite a lot of money. Okay, so that's uh, uh, NQ, which is a narrative question. So within the recommendations, there are also remarks which illustrate or which discuss it in a little bit more depth. Okay, so let us move on. Um, so the patient's got a normal sweat chloride um, and uh, has got a normal IgG, A, uh, M and E. Uh, the vaccine responses were normal. Child was too young to do spirometry, so we couldn't do spirometry. We undertook a bronchoscopy and uh, a bronchoevela lavage, and uh, this is what we found in the lavage. The child had neutrophilia, um, just mild, uh, 8 14%. And uh, you can see Moraxella cateralis in a high density at 10 to the power of 8. CFU per mil. So this child had an infection in, in, the, um, in the lungs. Um, in this particular child, uh, I also undertook a uh, video fluoroscopy, but we showed no aspiration. And the reason for doing this is that the child had cerebral palsy and also had dysphagia. Remember, the child had difficulty in um, swallowing and uh, spluttering uh, as well. Um, and as I mentioned, the PCD test was not indicated, so I did not do that. So uh, the working underlying diagnosis is uh, previous chronic sub previous chronic immune lung disease and, and post infection in this particular child. So I even I gave this child four weeks of amoxicillin at a higher dose because when I asked mom what dose was used, uh, she said it was a pretty low dose, and that's possibly why the cough came back uh, very quickly. Um, and then mom asked, um, would asthma therapy help? Because remember, this child also has um, wheezing. So we've got a recommendation here. It's a PICO question in children with bronchiectasis. Should asthma type therapies compared uh, to uh, non asthma type therapy be routinely used? And we subgrouped it for short versus long term and stable versus um, um, exacerbation states. And this is the recommendation. We suggest not using corticosteroids with or without LABAS or long-acting beta-2 agonists routinely in a short or long term, irrespective of stability or exacerbation. However, you may use that in different uh, circumstances, such as children with eosinophilic airway inflammation, um, uh, but there are actually not very many studies, and we certainly use them um, before we do things like hypertonic cell line. Okay, so it may be beneficial in, in some children. Which then brings us to um, the next component, which is to um, uh, look at the uh, PICO uh, type of format. And the reason why we don't do um, that is uh, the, the substantial, um, substantial side effects, as you can see there, uh, where data has shown that there's growth failure, adrenal suppression, um, and RCTs in adults show that increased use of ICS are associated with uh, non tuberculous uh, mycobacteria uh, as well. So, everything that we've recommended, uh, we, we also undertake this component of, of the great process with the parents. Um, so, after you've treated the, the child, you have to obviously talk to the parents and you talk about long term prognosis. So what is, what is this child's long-term prognosis, which brings us to the next question. Um, so is radio radiological bronchiectasis reversible in children? Um, Ali, you want to put yours up? So A is yes, um, B is no, um, C is sometimes if it's diagnosed early and ultimately treated, and the last option is uh, possible um, only if there's no underlying cause. So which is the uh, correct answer?
So yeah, right. the majority of people have it again. Well done, seventy-three percent. That's great. So that is actually the correct answer. So um, and we go to our recommendation here. Um, that's the correct answer. The recommendation uh, with respect to the question is bronchiectasis reversible and or preventable. Um, and this is what we said. It's actually a good practice statement that uh, in some it can be reversible and it can be um, preventable, but obviously sometimes uh, it's just not, not absolutely possible. So because of lack of evidence, etc., we couldn't really make a proper recommendation, but we made a good practice statement. Okay. So uh, factors important for reversibility is prevention, um, which includes early identification and treatment of foreign bodies, uh, pneumonia, preventing protracted bacterial bronchitis, treating immunity, breastfeeding, humanization, and avoiding tobacco smoke, etc. It's kind of standard uh, um, kind of comments anyway. Okay, so um, the thing about treating cough early is that uh, most of us in long clinical practice, we know that this actually happens. The longer the cough, the worse the lung functions. And this is a study by Paul King in the Melbourne group in adults showing that uh, the duration of cough on the x-axis versus their lung function on the y-axis. And you can see very clearly there that even for a very gross measure, that the R value was actually really high and it's even higher in non-smokers, where the longer you have the cough, uh, so you diagnose later, the poorer your FEV1 at diagnosis. Um, and there's also data in children, and this is um, Costas's group in Greece. Uh, where he looked at um, uh, cough and the BALA score, which is a score in bronchiectasis. Um, as you know, uh, kids can't do lung function um, from a young age, and therefore uh, what he did was to look at the radi radiological score, again showing that the longer the cough, the worse the um, radiological score. So this is a paradigm that we use. Uh, you can get uh, infection, which you've left untreated. You get radiological bronchiectasis. Initially, it's reversible, and then eventually it becomes irreversible. So you've spoken to the parents now about long-term prognosis. The next thing is to make them aware of exacerbations. So we know that exacerbations are really important to parents, um, as well as to patients with bronchiectasis. It has substantial burden and also has effect on future outcomes and because it's so important to parents I just want to show you so this is one of the questions from the parent survey that was um, worldwide uh, in 10 languages and uh, Jeanette Bolt summarized this data and you can see that um, exacerbations uh, with respect to having an action plan and finding triggers were the highest um, uh, amongst the um, questions. And this is Nitin Kapoor's work, uh, again, uh, showing um, scales of uh, depression and anxiety. And in the uh, brown bars is during an exacerbation. And uh, there's a substantial increase in stress, anxiety, and depression when their children have an exacerbation during an, um, sorry, when children have an exacerbation and the parents have uh, a poor um, quality of life. And lastly, uh, with respect to exacerbation, we know that in PCV anyway, there's a failure to return to baseline in three months. And uh, again, in Nitin's work, uh, we found that uh, every hospitalization, you have significant drop in the lung function um, by 1.64 points. Uh, so preventing exacerbations is actually really important. Okay, so um, how do we define exacerbations? Um, this is important because if you want to, to treat it, you need to be able to define it. And in the guidelines, this is what we say. We suggest that exacerbation is considered present when the child or adolescent has increased respiratory symptoms, predominantly increased cough and increased sputum with or without prolonance for three days or more. Okay, and it's a conditional recommendation. Um, there are some remarks there, as you can see. The parents also talk about the behavior change, fatigue, um, change in appetite, um, etc. Um, the key thing is that uh, the clinicians should not rely on changes in chest auscultation findings. Because often you hear that the parents come to us and say the doctor didn't find, couldn't hear anything on the chest and therefore they didn't give any antibiotics. So it's wrong to, def to depend on that and also do not depend on chest x-ray findings. So in the clinical context, we also recommend that the presence of dyspnea 
um, increased work of breathing or hypoxia is considered a severe exacerbation irrespective of duration. So you don't have to wait for three days to define this. So you've got to talk to the parents um, about uh, what to look for during an exacerbation and then how to manage it as well. So how do we manage it? The question then in the guideline is, should an antibiotic cost be given? And is there any evidence for this? And the recommendation is that in children with bronchiectasis with an exacerbation, we recommend a systemic cost of an appropriate antibiotic for 14 days. It's a strong recommendation. And the empiric antibiotic of choice is amoxiclavonec, but uh, you may have to alter the type of antibiotics chosen based on the child's um, airway uh, microbiology. Okay, but when an exacerbation is severe, they should really be uh, admitted into hospital, or if you don't respond to antibiotic, then you may have to give them intravenous um, treatment. So that's what we tell our parents uh, when we first diagnose them. And this is some of the evidence. Uh, you can see there's only a single study, um, but uh, the quality is high because uh, using the great stuff, um, um, and um, uh, the, it also influences the length of um, exacerbations uh, when you use antibiotics. So you've spoken to the parents about prognosis, you've spoken to them about awareness of uh, exacerbations and how to treat them. Then mom correctly asks, so how, what can I do to keep my child well? So you then go on to the aims of treatment of uh, bronchiectasis, and it is to optimize lung growth in young children, to preserve uh, lung function uh, in children, um, uh, thirdly, to optimize the quality of life, uh, fourthly, to minimize the number of exacerbations, to prevent complications from um, bronchiectasis, and lastly, if possible, reverse the structural lung disease that you see on CT scans. So we know that in the treatment of bronchiectasis, there's general stuff and there's specific treatment. So let us look at the general treatment. And here comes another recommendation, um, which is a NQ, a narrative question. So in children or uh, adolescents with bronchiectasis, should attention be paid to other pediatric systemic care, nutrition, exercise, psychological support, equipment care, vaccinations, etc. Um, and obviously the answer is yes. Um, I won't go through every single thing, but the evidence is presented in uh, summary form in the tables within the guidelines. Um, and you'd be surprised to ask, you know, why do we need to actually say this? Uh, and the answer is it is important for parents to actually show it to some of the doctors who don't believe that all this is important. So that's why we actually spelled it out uh, very uh, thoroughly so it becomes a full guideline, okay? So clearly, we encourage exercise, nutrition should be optimized. Uh, sometimes you have to focus on vitamin D. If there's a, a risk of getting vitamin D deficiency, we would definitely suggest immunization. Uh, and we obviously promote psychological support, which includes education and equipment, um, use and care, as well as promoting breastfeeding, etc. Okay. Um, then there's obviously specific uh, treatment for bronchiectasis, bronchiectasis, and I think most of you would know that um, airway clearance or physiotherapy is one of the standard ways. So it comes to our fourth question. So uh, regarding airway clearance therapies, so chest physiotherapy, which of the following is true? So um, airway clearance should be used every day, irrespective of severity and condition of bronchiectasis. The types of um, airway clearance therapy for children change as they mature um, and are best taught by expert chest physiotherapists. Uh, during an exacerbation, airway clearance therapy should remain the same. And not, not all children with bronchitis require um, education. If you could put your submit buttons in or your answers in, please. So that's great. So most people got it right as well. So um, clearly, um, it should be best taught by chest physiotherapists. 
So sometimes when the child is really well and they got very few exacerbations, you know, they're almost cured from their bronchitis, they don't actually need um, daily um, airway clearance therapy. Um, and during an exacerbation, obviously, we need uh, to increase the frequency of airway clearance therapy. And irrespective of the severity of bronchitis, they should all be taught how to do airway clearance therapy. Okay. So let us move on to the uh, recommendation. Um, so the answer is B, as mentioned. So in the recommendation, um, the question posed was, should every clearance therapy um, be undertaken? Uh, and we sub-analyze sub it um, uh, for short and long term. Uh, and this is a recommendation. We recommend that they are taught and receive regular ACT or maneuvers. Um, so the regular is the key thing, you know, it's not necessary every single day okay and uh, because ACT or every clearance is developmental and age appropriate is best taught by a pediatric trained um, a chest physiotherapist and as they mature um, they need uh, uh, to be uh, reviewed uh, to change their frequency and type of therapy and during an exacerbation they obviously need more frequent uh, every clearance therapies so in the guideline, you will see that there's a diagram that looks like this. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, there is um, the different types. Uh, and on the top, you can see infant, toddler, child, and adolescent. And it gives you uh, the range of the possibilities of uh, uh, the types of um, every clearance therapy. Okay, so it should be age-adjusted and it should be cognitive-adjusted because not every three-year-old uh, is the same. Okay. So um, let us move on to the next patient. So this is a child that I've been looking after for a long time. He had tetraglycerol fellow that was repaired at six months. He was first referred to me when he was five. And I actually just transferred him to the adult team. He, when he presented, he had chronic back cough, a uh, daily chronic back cough, he had no digital clubbing. So I did a CT scan, um, uh, MBCT and HRCT. Um, and uh, these are his pictures. You can see here he had almost complete collapse of his basal segments. Okay. So mom asked, should we remove that abnormal lung? Because you can see that the majority of the abnormality, or at least the ones that I've shown you, that he actually does have abnormality elsewhere, is in uh, the um, uh, right uh, lower basal segments. Okay. And here is our recommendation. Um, what factors should be taken into account when considering surgical removal of the diseased lung? Firstly, it is important to know that surgery is now rarely undertaken in our panel's experience, um, but uh, we know that it's taken um, in other um, um, places. So we should only consider um, surgery in, in selected um, scenarios. Okay. So we recommend that if you're considering surgery, you should take into account the age, the symptoms, the disease burden, the localization of bronchiectasis on the CT scan, the underlying etiology, and the facility where surgery is undertaken, as well as optimizing the child's clinical state. Okay, so I won't, I won't read through everything, but uh, that's all in the guidelines. So you just need to know that um, we don't advocate surgery, but if you go and consider surgery, you need to carefully look at uh, a lot of, uh, of things and work the child up uh, adequately. So let us move on. Um, I've answered mom's question. I, do, I did all these at that time. Um, nasal cilia electron microscopy was inconclusive because this child had tetraglia fellow. Um, I did the PCD stuff at that time. The cilia motility was mainly synchronous. Um, I gave the child uh, two weeks of antibiotics, educated the, the mom, and then the cost substantially improved. Okay. So um, over the years, we would monitor um, the child. Um, the child. So the question then is, uh, how often should airway microbiology testing be undertaken? How frequent should they be seen in our patients? And how should cross infection be uh, minim uh, minimized? Okay. So these are our recommendations. So we suggest that um, sputums be taken at least six to 12 monthly. Um, to try and identify new pathogens. Um, we suggest that they be seen on a three to six monthly basis in the outpatient by an expert group to monitor their well-being, respiratory status, lung function, 
uh, and also to detect any complications. And we suggest that the family be cons consult, cons sorry, uh, consult on cough and uh, hand hygiene, and also to avoid um, those with um, viral uh, respiratory infections. And just be careful that uh, if you're managing a CF clinic, that uh, you don't uh, get the, the bugs uh, sent to you as well. Okay. So um, in this particular child, you can see that uh, uh, he has had lots of um, uh, sputums done over the years. Um, he's actually grown a strep pneumonia in most of uh, that time. That's in spite of getting his, um, all his uh, vaccines, including his um, PPV23. And then over the years, uh, at some point, uh, he had pseudomonas. So which brings us to our next question. Uh, which is um, regarding a new isolation of pseudomonas, which of the flow is true. Um, Ali, if you want to put yours up. Um, the first is because the child does not have CF, it is unnecessary to you to treat the pseudomonas. The second option is pseudomonas cannot be eradicated in patients with bronchiectasis. The third is um, pseudomonas should not be ignored. And lastly, all efforts, sorry, pseudomonas can be ignored. And lastly, all efforts to eradicate pseudomonas should be undertaken once the infection is confirmed. So which is true? If you could quickly um, submit, and Ali, if you could make this a little bit shorter um, so we can get on with it. Um, great, fantastic. This is the best answer so far, 96%. And most of you are absolutely correct. Okay, so you'll be surprised to hear, but uh, I've had colleagues who tell me, oh, the kids got bronchitis, the pseudomonas doesn't matter, and that um, if it's there, you can't eradicate it. So clearly the answer is D, uh, which is we have to make all efforts to eradicate it. So here comes the recommendation and the question, um, should eradication be undertaken irrespective of symptoms when there's new isolation? And the answer is obviously yes. Although because there's very low quality of evidence, it is conditional. And there's uh, remarks as well, which uh, points to the lack of, um, of evidence. So in the guideline, there is actually a flow diagram um, done by Keith Grimwood, uh, where you would see a new isolation and you would follow uh, the diagram. And we would advocate a similar th therapy to people with CF, which is IV antibiotics for two days, dual therapy, followed by inhaled antibiotics uh, for a few weeks. Okay, so let us now move on to uh, further monitoring. So when you see a child routinely in clinic, what tests should be undertaken to detect complications? Should the CT scan be repeated? And in gradually deteriorating patients, what investigations should be undertaken? So these are real questions because at some point, uh, patients come back to you and uh, these things often happen. Okay. So we would suggest that they have, a, they have routine tests and that includes a lung function when age appropriate in sputum, which we already mentioned in pulse oximetry. Uh, we suggest uh, the decision to repeat CT scan is individualized based on clinical status and setting. And we would only recommend it if um, you needed to answer a specific question that would change management. And in people uh, whose clinical status is gradually deteriorating, uh, we suggest uh, looking for new infections, and sometimes that includes uh, doing a bronchoscopy and looking for other comorbidities. Okay, so back to my patient. So uh, I mentioned that he was five. So the next year when he was six, that was his first lung function, 72 and 82 FEV and FVC. Over the years, uh, he actually improved. You can see that his lung function went up to the low 80s. It's not normal, but certainly it's in the, sorry, it's in the normal range, but in the low normal range. And you can see that over the years, um, subsequent to that, he had a low, he had a gradual decline to the 70s. So um, that's when I repeated the CT scan just to make sure that I wasn't missing anything. Uh, and uh, I'll show you his CT scan that was repeated. Um, so that was to the, I'm sorry, these buttons don't work very well. Um, there's a little delay. Will we go back? So you can see that um, um, that was his first, on the top left-hand panel, that was his first um, um, CT scan. 
Um, I repeated in 2008 uh, because he still had a lot of symptoms then. Um, and you can see it was substantially better compared to the one there. And back in 2019, in spite of the um, drop in lung function, his CT scan actually um, was uh, uh, improved. Okay. So during the regular clinics, when I saw this kid, um, obviously things changed and the gene test um, became available. Um, I done his gene test and he only had a single gene because and therefore he's not homozygous for anything so it's negative and his nasal ENO was actually borderline although he clinically has um, the PCD phenotype. He gets recurrent exacerbations four to five times a year. Okay so it then brings us to uh, what other modalities of treatment do we have? So let us look at the next question. So to reduce exacerbations in children with bronchiectasis which of the following is false? Um, Ali, if you want to put yours up, please. Um, first option is they should be all, um, offered um, uh, nebulized um, pomazyme or RNDNAs that we use in CF. Second option is nebulized hypotonic um, saline or mannitol may be beneficial in some children. Um, three is regular oral azithromycin is an option as there is our randomized control trial evidence that it halves the number of exacerbations. And lastly, um, attention to contributing factors um, are important. So which of the following is false? If you could quickly um, take um, your choice. And um, Ali will make this brief, please, Ali. So, um, OK, so that's where it is. So the, correct, that's, that's where most people are correct, that they should not be uh, given um, um, Pomazine, and I'll show you the reasons why after this. So that's correct. Um, the majority got it correct, um, where the false answer is, is that there's this one here. Okay, so there's actually um, the recommendation with respect to nucleoactive agents, whether they should be used um, routinely, and we again subgrouped it. And these are recommendations that we recommend that. Uh, uh, Pomazine is not used routinely, and that's a strong recommendation. We suggest that bromhexin is not used routinely, and we suggest that uh, mannitol and uh, hypotonsilin is also not used routinely, but uh, that's a weak recommendation, and there are actually situations where you would recommend using mannitol or hypotonic saline, uh, as you can uh, read there, which I won't read out for you, but uh, there is some evidence that it, it works, but only in adults, okay, so very little evidence in children. So the reason why we don't use um, pomazyme is there's this study, a multi-center study done in the States, where they thought that it would benefit and it actually showed that um, um, people receiving pomazyme had uh, not only increased exacerbations and hospitalization, but they also had a more rapid lung function decline. So the key message is that not all treatments for cystic fibrosis can be safely applied in children without cystic fibrosis. All right, so the next question, the next recommendation is should long-term antibiotics or macrolides be used to uh, reduce exacerbations? And our recommendation here is that we do recommend uh, long-term macrolides to you to reduce exacerbations. It's a strong recommendation, but low quality of evidence, and I'll show you why. So we would suggest that uh, they use it if they've got more than one hospitalization or more than three exacerbations in the previous 12 months. And if you use it, you should use it for at least six months and reassess the benefit. Um, and if they've used it for more than 24 months, you should also reassess the benefit. Um, and uh, the reason is because of the two uh, other uh, dot points beneath that. So let us look at the evidence. So if you can see here, that um, the, um, there are three studies um, in this particular PICO, and uh, you can see that um, there is high evidence, um, but I'm sorry, this button is very slow. You can see there's high evidence with exacerbations um, in terms of number as well as number of patients with exacerbations. But if you uh, go to the other outcomes, you can see that um, days lost from school was considered by the parents to be a critical outcome. And because um, um, there was no data there um, that is significant, the quality is low. 
And with all these recommendations in the um, ERS um, protocol, if you've got any low uh, quality, it will have to be rated as low. So you've got to remember that uh, this is the reason why it's been given a low um, quality. So um, in summary, um, I hope I've shown you uh, that uh, this is the first international um, clinical practice guidelines for pediatric bronchiectasis. Um, we've looked at diagnosis, investigation and treatment. We use a very strict grade approach um, consisting of seven PICOs and seven narrative questions. Um, remember that uh, this was a multidisciplinary panel with substantial input from the European Lung Foundation and the parents. Um, and uh, the objectives of managing children and adolescents with bronchiectasis are to optimize the lung function, to preserve their lung function, to optimize their quality of life, minimize exacerbations, prevent complications, and lastly, if possible, to, rever to reverse the structural lung disease. And I show you two of my patients. I can show you multiple patients because we've got plenty of these. And this is a kid, 2006 above, 2015 below, you can see the bronchiectasis is resolved. And even this particular child who is uh, from a different country who came to us, uh, had TB, and you can see severe bronchiectasis on the left panel, on the right panel, three years later, even though the child still had bronchiectasis, and the similar cut is substantially much better. So, um, and that's the end. And again, I would just like to to thank uh, the panel, um, um, the European Respiratory Society for uh, funding the task force, uh, the Lung Foundation, um, and also my research teams uh, in Darwin and Brisbane. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anne. It is a wonderful lecture, and I'm very happy that you was able to apply the guidelines on your own patients. This is a demonstration that guidelines are needed for a clinician for his daily practice. So I would like to ask you some of the questions that arrived by the participants. Dr. Erson is asking about inhaled antibiotics. And we add another question about the use of antibiotics as a prof prophylaxic measurement. And this is a question by Delgrado, please. So uh, we didn't look at inhaled antibiotics uh, because we didn't find any particular uh, studies uh, in that whatsoever in children. So there are now adult studies um, on inhaled uh, antibiotics and uh, with Orbit that has been published and there's another group, I can't remember what, yeah, it starts with R, I'm sorry, I can't remember, but Orbit Orbit once uh, showed some, some benefit in, in adults. Um, so that's um, my, uh, liposomal um, uh, superfloxacin. So we, didn't, we, the, we were very limited uh, in the number of pickles um, because that's an ERS. They were limited to only seven pickles. We took the maximum number that we were allowed. Um, so we, can't, we didn't actually uh, have any specific uh, recommendations on inhaled antibiotics uh, because of that. So I can't quite say anything with respect to that in the guidance except to say that we don't actually have information. With respect to prophylactic antibiotics, the last PICO, which is the last one that I showed, um, on the use of macrolides. Um, so in those with um, recurrent exacerbations, we recommend macrolides. Uh, we do not recommend um, starting macrolides on anybody with just with any bronchiectasis because the mild ones, you probably don't need to um, give macrolides. So the evidence is kind of a little bit washy there because um, the actual randomized control trial that we mentioned, that study, which is actually my study with um, my collaborators, uh, showed uh, the inclusion criteria was two exacerbations in 18 months. So in that respect, you could use it, but everything that we recommend, we have to take a balance of benefits and, and um, uh, side effects. And remember in this day and age of antimicrobial stewardship, we just got to be a little bit careful. So at this point, we would only recommend if they have more than three exacerbations in a year or more than one hospitalization. Okay, two more questions. And one from Dr. Kasim is asking about when do you start thinking about PCD in your practice? Silly dyskinesia. Another one yeah. about the role of reflux in bronchiectasis. So um, PCD is a very complex world, depending on whether you live in America or whether you live in European. 
So uh, there are two major guidelines and there are some similarities, but there are actually major differences as well. So um, personally, I actually do use the Peter Kass score, um, but if they don't fulfill the Peter Kass score, I would still um, evaluate them um, if I think they've got a phenotype. So, you know, the, the usual having um, oxygen requirement at neonates, uh, being tachypneic at neonates, having a uh, cardiac abnormality, having a daily wet cough, nasal symptoms, uh, family history, um, chronic ear disease, uh, those sort of stuff. So um, I do use the Peter Casco, but I don't use it as, uh, you know, it's not black and white for me. That's what I do clinically because I don't know how much it costs in Europe, uh, but for us uh, to do the genes, uh, the genes miss about 30%. Um, and uh, you, it's not 100% uh, sensitive. And also, um, it costs about 800 Australian dollars uh, for us. So it's pretty expensive. Uh, and not everybody can do uh, cilia because it's got to be fresh. Um, reflux, about reflux also, the role of gastroesophageal reflux and... Okay. Yeah, so so um, there's actually very little data, um, but uh, if you want to look at reflux, there's actually a really good uh, guideline uh, by the uh, NAPGAN group, so which is North American group with the European group combined together, um, and that was published two years ago. And there's also a guideline by the uh, NICE group uh, in in the, in the UK. So uh, we would not screen them for reflux. Uh, if they are symptomatic, we would um, uh, refer them to the gastro people to actually evaluate that because we would definitely not suggest giving PPIs. If this is not in the guideline, we would not suggest giving PPIs, uh, proton pump inhibitors, without investigation because I think everybody now knows that uh, if you give PPIs, you actually do risk um, increased uh, exacerbations. Okay, thanks, Zank. There are many questions about the CT scanning. When do you ask for a CT scan? And whether you need to have a contrast with the CT scan with contrast or without contrast, please. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. They're excellent questions. So um, remember the guidelines is limited. We didn't actually say when they should, look, when you should actually subject to a CT scan. So I'm going to give you my practice. So obviously, if they've got two or more pneumonias um, uh, in a 12 month space, or if they've got a chronic cough, um, that's not responsive to four weeks of antibiotics. So if you pick up some of the um, um, wrong cases review article, we wrote a good one with Andy Bush and Keith Greenwood um, two years ago in the Lancet. And that one actually would tell you uh, when to actually uh, consider a CT scan and, and the reasons why as well. So if they got recurrent PBB, um, more than three episodes a year, if they got chronic red cough and uh, you treat the chronic red cough antibiotics for four weeks and they don't resolve, then I would definitely consider a CT scan after they've got recurrent pneumonia. And obviously, if they've got clubbing or they've got aspiration and a whole lot of other, other factors, but those are the three most common reasons. In case we have a limited, limited area of bronchiectasis, do you recommend surgery for this if you have no reason behind this bronchiectasis? That's one question. So uh, when I was much younger, <laughs> uh, back in the, back in the 19, uh, late 1990s and early 2000, and I didn't know a lot of bronchiectasis, I did subject one child to surgery. And that's the only child I've subjected to surgery in my entire career. I have seen my, some of my colleagues do it and you find that later that this child actually has even a deficiency of PCD, which is a bit sad. But anyway, um, it's actually very, very rare now that we subject children for surgery um, because most of the time you can actually get their bronchiectasis better. And the key thing is that even if you remove the bronchiectasis lobe, sometimes um, the symptoms and all, we, all return and the cost-benefit ratio is not really there. So with respect to contrast... Okay, what about the use of magnetic resonance? Okay. Right. Sorry, so the, the contrast in CT scans. Personally, um, I, I do it um, because you actually pick things up, really rare things like um, absent uh, veins, um, unilateral or bilateral, um, and you pick um, tracheal malacia, you know, uh, vascular compression. But I think you got to talk to your radiologists. Some of them will not be happy. 
I personally do. I we all do contrast in every single child with in our CT scans. Um, it's not in the guidelines because there's no evidence for that. One more question about the use of magnetic resonance in these subjects for the follow up. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean the, that's a possibility, but we didn't see anything in our guidelines uh, because um, how are we going to compare a CT to an MRI is not that easy to 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 compare. The key question is why why do you want another repeat um, a scan? Um, so MRI is sure it's expensive. It may not have any side effects that we know at this point in time. Maybe down the track people will find a side effect. I don't know. Um, so just just remember whatever you do in medicine, you gotta ask the question about what's the benefit um, okay. of risk. Thank you. Two questions about the use of inhaled corticosteroids, and some people refer they are a good experience with this drug within their patients. How can you comment this? Yeah, I mean, if they've got, if they've got, um, I, I've got plenty of my children on, on the um, um, corticosteroids as well. I'm not saying that do not use it. I'm saying that do not use it without thinking about it, okay, and without evaluating it. So I would use it if they've got an asthma type phenotype. In many children, you actually can find reversibility or and they've got asthma with a bronchiectasis. So definitely use it when um, um, it's beneficial. But I would say, please think about, do the child really benefit from it? And then if you use it, take them off it to see whether it actually is beneficial or not. So don't just put the child on it and leave it on it forever. Okay, so, you know, there is a subgroup of children that will benefit from it. And what proportion of patients have idiopathic cause, idiopathic bronchiectasis in your experience? And what do you do with them? Yeah, that, that really depends on the, um, the population. So um, where I do my Aboriginal work, most of it, you call it idiopathic or is it post-infection? You know, it's a bit hard uh, to know which is which. Um, the, the, the proportion ranges from, you know, 90% in some centres to 50% um, in or even lower than that in, in other centres. And it also depends on how severe the bronchiectasis is. So if you pick up bronchiectasis early, or very often you don't find um, you don't find a, a cause for it, and a lot of them are reversible. Okay. So um, what do we do about them? We treat them the same as um, someone with an underlying cause. Obviously, with the underlying cause, you give them additional stuff. But the basic treatment, the six principles I outlined, is exactly the same. Okay. What do you think about using force? oscillations in patients to study lung function in small children? Yeah, that's another um, big topic in itself. Um, so when, when uh, Nitin Kapoor, who did his PhD with me, um, looked at fault in exacerbations with bronchiectasis to see whether we could pick abnormality on the young children, we actually found no difference. Um, so I can tell you that exacerbations is probably going to be beneficial. Um, I think um, at this point in time, if you want to use it as a monitoring tool, go ahead. But as an um, absolute tool, I, I suggest that the, the cost, you know, fault, I don't know what ha what happens in your center, but in our center on Medicaid is about two hundred dollars because it's very time intensive. So I don't think the benefit is there in terms of cost. Okay, we can take one more question about the saline hypertonic saline use. Do you have, can give some suggestions other than the guidelines that you mentioned? So I, I personally use it in those who have a lot of exacerbations who do not res who still have exacerbations with um, um, macrolides. So you optimize the physiotherapy, you refer them to the physiotherapy, you optimize everything else in their, um, in their clinical day-to-day um, uh, -day stuff, um, nutrition, immunization. So you've done all that, okay? Um, you've checked their sputum and they haven't got new bugs and they still have lots of exacerbations. In those children, I do offer them hypertonic cell line. Okay. But remember, burden of treatment is, is a real thing for parents. If you give hypertonic cell line, there's a real burden of treatment. Um, but if the kids have lots of exacerbations, parents are usually happy to try it anyway. That's my personal experience. Okay. But I, we wouldn't use it routinely. Um, but in selected patients, I think there is some benefit. Okay, But again, you don't put them on it. Send them on a merry way, okay? You've got to teach them how to use the equipment. You've got to give them um, give a trial therapy to make sure that they don't have bronchospasm. You will give them... Uh, 
better to agonize before you, you give them hypertonic saline. And then after you put them on the trial therapy, you would take them off it as well. In some of the kids as well, I've used it only during exacerbations because the parents say that it helps them. So. Okay, there is one more question about reversible bronchiectasis. That is defined, depends on whether it is defined histologically or radiologically. Definitely not histologically. Nobody does biopsy on bronchiectasis these days. So this is radiologically definition. So the, the, the question was whether that depends on histological case or cause of this, uh, of well, this reversibility. If you have an analogy never, about thing. We would, never, we would never find any histological diagnosis. So nobody does biopsies on bronchiectasis to diagnose bronchiectasis these days. So the original description by Lenac was on post-mortem stuff. Um, and uh, we don't want people to die from bronchiectasis. Okay, and thank you very much for your kind contribution and for this very helpful, uh, not only talk, but also chat with you. I would like to thank you, thank the rest for their contribution, like all the participants for their contribution. And uh, we hope if you share more knowledge about bronchiectasis with you and with other participants in this meeting. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. you, Anne. Okay, bye. Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you all.